the Navratna show is really a unique way to try and understand why these artists are important for us. You know, each one is completely different in style, each one is completely different in the depiction that they bring forward to us. And the scale, size, everything about these artworks is quite stupendous. And I'm really glad that the larger public gets a chance to see these amazing artworks. Works by the master artist Raja Ravi Varma are on display. He's fairly well known across the uh, subcontinent, largely popular because of the um, print mechanism that disseminated his images to a very, very large audience. But here you get to see some of his portraits as well. And um, you see a few of the more important European characters that he painted, especially a child which is on show at the exhibition. Abhinav Sunath was trained in the Western art tradition under European masters, but temperamentally he couldn't relate to that very much. And he also decided to experiment with new forms of painting which draws upon the traditional practices. He was more interested in the amateur traditions, including those of the West. So he was looking at miniature painting both in India and in Europe, and combining these, he tried to develop a style of his own, which is normally called the wash technique. Gogenin Nartagore clearly stands out his incredible caricature figures, the kind of sketching that he did, the nuance that he captured in his lines uh, is something unprecedented in, in Indian art. And even today in contemporary artists, I really don't see that level of uh, line, uh, that level of emotion coming through, even a sense of narrative or movement that Gauganendra Nath Tagore could capture. Of course, the Bengal school had a great success in terms of its acceptance across India. Rabindranath was feeling a little uneasy about what was happening. His critic of the Bengal school uh, was on several counts, trying to build an identity on the basis of past histories. The Bengal school was neglecting contemporary world and contemporary Indian reality. Around 1890s, his father forced him to go to rural Bengal and look after their family estates. He went there reluctantly, but once he reached there, it opened up a new world to him. He became familiar with the immense landscape of Bengal, its beauty, but it also awakened him to the miseries of the peasant. So this experience helped him to evolve as a better and different writer. He thought this is the route that Indian artists should also take. So then he turned to the next generation of painters. Foremost amongst them was Nandalal. So he went with Rabindranath to the villages and he fell in love with the landscape and his art began to change a little bit. On the one hand, we say that he shifts from the hothouse culture of Calcutta to actually looking at tribals in and around Shantiniketan. So when he paints an Arjun in Shantiniketan, he's actually looking at the village archer. And the village archer becomes Arjun. So you see that the, the, the transference between the mythology and the real, it, it's, it's, it's osmotic and it's bi-directional. You know, it flows from one to the other. You know, the, the real becomes the mythological. The mythological is actually seen through the real. So that's where I find Nandalal very significant as an artist to look at from the point of view of why he is so important in the history of Indian art. Artists who are coming in to the grassroots somewhere, something that Amrita Shergill typifies, uh, half Indian, half Hungarian, uh, taught uh, to paint in the Parisian salon style at the Beaux-Arts uh, Institute in Paris decides to come to India. She goes off into a small town in the United Provinces uh, and she starts painting again uh, people that she sees around herself, villagers, village girls, uh, you know, the little storyteller somewhere, siestas in the afternoon on a string cot. So there is a total reversal of how India was looked at through the eyes of artists 
and somewhere the subaltern becomes very prominent in this art practice. Uh, from this you move on to the skylines of uh, Kashmir and of the hills uh, of the Himalayas largely taken by Nicholas Rorick and you realize that anybody who's been to the hills it takes you a while to realize the enormity of the scale of the mountains around you and how insignificant we as humans are in the in the larger scale of things and this is what Rorick was able to capture in most of his images uh, his use of very strong colors like a blue or a tangerine yellow these are just not colors, these are moods, these are uh, scale variations, these are things that exemplify the mountains as they appear to him. And we are quite fortunate that we have two or three of his paintings which are on display here. Jaminira is from an absolutely urban context. He's trained in the, in the Government College of Art and Craft. And he's trained in the European mode. And how he shifts towards the folk is through the filter of the post-impressionistic language. One of the primary sources for Jaminira was the Kaligat painting. And if one places two pictures that are very closely similar, you know, Yashoda and Krishna with the cow from the Kaligat painting uh, tradition, beside the, the transition, the, the, the it's not a copy, it's, it's a translation. It's a transliteration that it did by Jaminira. One sees this, this point of difference very clearly. The line is a, is, a, is a trained line. The line is a mathematically perfect line. It begins at a point, it emerges into a thickness, it ends at a point, which is so precisely calculated that the preciseness sort of stills his picture. It doesn't have the lively throb of the Kaligat any longer. But nevertheless, it has the, the, the lovely rhythm of, of, of one line responding to the next. So he refines and refinement and sophistication are at the core of what Chaminera did with the folk. <laughs> 